We need more prisons, more jails, more courts. When I sign this crime bill, we together are taking a big step toward bringing the laws of our land back into line with the values of our people. Now we have three strikes and you're out for violent offenders. There are more people being sentenced to prison in this country than there is prison space to house them. One of the effects of crowding, you get more and more emergence of an inmate society, and the inmate society is notoriously uh, dangerous. Other inmates then stop and beat the unconscious 39. A correctional officer's life is cut short on the job. Report show the inmates were armed with scissors and hammers. Four employees were killed. An already bursting jail and prison system becoming more problematic. Prisons have long been plagued with safety concerns, stressful work environments, and low pay. 39% higher chance of suicide than pretty much any other job. For context, I've been fired, suspended, assaulted, gassed, tased, intervened in fights, stabbings, riots. I've seen loss of life. I almost lost my wife, my family, and myself. My father, Michael Mellon, retired a captain from Sousa Baranowski Supermax Prison in Massachusetts at the age of 45 after 22 years of working for the Department of Corrections. He only lived about 18 months after he retired, and he killed himself. Commissioners, these stories are not unique. They're not anomalous. Unfortunately, the testimonies that you'll hear today are the truth and reality of countless correctional officers across the globe. Until we transform prisons from human warehouses to places of accountability and rehabilitation, I'm afraid we're going to continue the insanity going forward. I'm going to have to take a step back and, and, and talk a bit about Norway. I'm not here to tell you that the U.S. should copy the Norwegian or Nordic model, uh, but it has some valid points. First and foremost, there is a fundamental link between employer and worker through the unions. Both employer and the unions have entered into the agreement with the purpose of creating the best possible basis for cooperation. And our work isn't done, but the expectations and conditions of incarcerated have changed and we are safer and more satisfied as a result. interested in what the unions thought about the Norway model, not what everybody else thought, not the heads of the department, not the people who are housed in the prison. We wanted to know what the unions thought about the system and what the staff thought. You'll make your own determination about whether the Norway model is good or bad, relevant, not relevant. But most importantly, as union leaders, you'll have a step up you're able to think about the interests of your members and your union and be in a stronger position to negotiate when that happens. How many of you in the state, county, city where you work, um, have you heard talk about the Norway model? I had a facilitator that came here and then tried to implement <laughs> the Norway model. If they didn't train anyone, they, they have no measurable means of success or anything. All it is is they're trying to take money that's out of their budget to pay for something. So there's a perception that we're doing all these things, but are we really having any reform? And the answer is no. Um, it's just smoke and mirrors. I'm coming hoping to really have eyes open and see something that is so different than what we do on a daily basis and to grab what I can that's good and see if it's possible to integrate that in what we do. I think to make this a home run would be to really find something that I can take back and make a change so that I'm not just turning a key and locking somebody in, but I help them build their life so that when they leave, they're better off than when they came in. But I think I will uh, tell you a little about when I started in the business back in the 80s. We had a very high reoffending rate in Norway. So uh, they said we have to make a plan and there we come to this white paper. And uh, the first principle is what we call the normality principle. And uh, that means that every inmate in Norwegian prisons have the same rights as all other who live in Norway. We also focus on what we call the dynamic security. 
and that means the interpersonal relationship between officers, between all the workers here, and the inmates. Generally speaking, they're on high alert they do the all the thing. time, yeah. very so stressful, and they would never work with no. someone no, that's I mean, incarcerated the way you do. And you say, I, I don't mind doing it. No. Right? No, I don't. Yeah. Why? Why? As I say, I, I know him. It's like this dynamic security, and we build a relation over time. So I can see in his face when he's in a bad mood or in a bad place, and I can see in his face when he's in a good place. Mm -hmm. So when he's in a good place, like my guys are right now, I have no problems going to pay their bills with them, going to the computer, doing phone calls, talk to them alone. Sometimes I take them out. You saw the forest outside? Yep. We had this path around this forest. Me just to yellow. see what's going on, what's your yeah, problem? Yeah, just to talk to them because happening. you know this walk and talk thing? Uh -huh. People open up when they walk. Yeah. I even have had an inmate talk asking me if I have children. And another inmate said, dude, that's not polite. Don't ask that. And I was just like, well, that's okay. I do have children. And I can say I have children. I can say the ages. And then there it stops, you know. So it's hugely frowned upon in California. Yeah. Being yeah. able to use this house, you have to go through a program that is called Dad in Prison. So it is about being a parent, how to talk to children, be around children, stuff like that. So it's a corporation, prison, social services how they do their incarceration to restorative, we do that on a day-to-day -day basis as parole officers. We're that contact manager, right? We're talking about housing, sheltering, and all that. The difference is the money that they spend on it. Mm -hmm. The budgetary money is more spent on the incarceration piece mm -hmm. instead of the rehabilitation piece. And yeah. that's the biggest difference. I'm truly impressed with how open everything is with the fact that it looks like uh, people are able to kind of move about without any restriction. We've had talks about this back home, of creating a therapeutic environment for rehabilitation purposes, and it looks like they have that here. Well thought out. So now at your table, I just want you to talk about, are there things you saw that you're like, that was really interesting, that was really different? Everybody looked at each other eye to eye, mm -hmm. shook hands, yeah. and they weren't, and then I was trying to name it what was different, and we named it in here as trust. Mm -hmm. Our yards are like a concrete jungle. They go out there, they in corners, they're doing their own activities. There's a lot of like gang activities going on, drugs being exchanged. Yeah, there's more visibility because there are plenty of things to go out there and do. I would love to. I would love to have something like this, oh. where it would be. Yes, as a unit organizer, I know these guys would be have a better life. Right now, there is no work-life balance. There is no life because you're you're on the edge the entire time. being in correction that's taken my family from me. I'm currently going through a divorce. I have three children and my two oldest children never got to experience me being home. People say to look for the best in people. I just usually see the worst. Sometimes I look around and I don't really see good in anybody. Mm -hmm. um, there's days where I look around and I don't necessarily see a lot of good in myself. I am a statistic. I've lost a wife and my stepdaughter. But uh, you know, I've, I've built myself back up, and uh, one voice has been uh, been a great purpose in my life. I think it has its days. Um, it's definitely not natural, but it's something that we learn to adjust to. We we go into an environment that we need to make sure we have control of, and I think that frequently leaks into our personal lives and leads to hyper vigilance and kind of always feeling on edge. I. I think that it's a decent job, it's a good job if people know how to handle it, but there are definitely days where we run into issues that we aren't necessarily prepared to handle. For me, I went in and I did 30 days of field training, and after that I was sent out on my own. For where I am, the only rule is that I have to complete the academy before I've reached my first anniversary. So it was a learning process for the whole I guess first year that I was there, trying to get comfortable, trying to make sure that I knew what my job was and that I was doing it properly. The judge says, okay, listen, you know, we can't put you in a correctional facility, so we're gonna put you in a psychiatric facility. So what happens is they, they then come to us and they come into an institution. So now we're dealing with someone who has a potential of harming not only us as professional staff, but also the patients that we have to care for. It was, it was difficult for us. 
It was very difficult because we weren't trained. I'm working as a correctional officer with very limited training. I have it now just because I gained it by doing it the same area for months, but I think it was like five or six week academy. Once a year, I take one day defensive tactics class. Other than that, it's been online training yearly. We need high education, higher education for prison officers. So our education is placed at the level six. It is a part of the bachelor and it's a two years program. This basic education is full time, it's paid. Half of the time they are here at the campus and then part time they are outside doing the practical studies in different prisons. And all these subjects are both theory and practice. Theory and practice. It's important for us to get the good people to work in the system. In the United States, you know, and many times where we hire people that have a hard time reading and writing just because we're trying to fill the correctional officer slots. You have an incredible amount of people applying for the positions. What is so attractive? Is it the money? Is it the, is it the purpose? Is it the culture? I mean, what, what attracts people to apply for the jobs? We are really curious about that. Would we have as many appliances if the study is not paid? Normally, if you want to go to, to school in Norway, it's like uh, Chastri says, it, you don't have to pay for it, and you get student loans, and you can work on the side and stuff like that. But this school, you're not going to have any loan. You're not going to have to work extra. You'll get a pay during your time here. So that is quite important to a lot of our applicants. On day one yep. of training, how do you greet your officers? How do I greet them? Welcome, sit down. Hello. I want to, uh, and uh, we, we, we take them in, uh, in the gym, yeah. and it's, uh, we're uh, two instructors, and we uh, sit down, and we get them to sit down around us. And we start up in the... Uh, oh, that's, that's entertaining to me, because the first hour of my academy classes, I, we were told to park in the parking lot, and these instructors come barreling out of their doors, and I had this big, massive man standing in front of my car screaming, why did you park there? Why did you park there? And I was like, oh, it's the only place we had. <laughs> if you Google prison, you'll find walls, you'll find uh, locks and keys. But we have um, a task that goes beyond that because we also have to think about security after the person is released. For me, it's about those meetings, the professional relationships that we build between our staff members and the residents. We are prison officers, we, we do all the social work as well. So we try to communicate with the prisoner what he wants to do with his time in prison. So maybe he wants to work, maybe he wants to go to school, and we have different departments for this. Uh, on a daily basis here, uh, we work together, uh, we do chores together, we uh, uh, train together, we go on trips together, and of course we get to know each other. How am I supposed to help him if he doesn't know me? And that's the dynamic, that's a security dynamic too. When you come here, you want to do change in your life, and if you're here or not, want to do change, and you want to bring the prison culture with you, then you have nothing here to do. How important to your success do you feel your relationship is with staff members? It's uh, very important, you know. If you love locking people up, that's what you love doing, coming to work, then you cannot work here, you know. So you have to have a kind of like a personal aspect to you that you want to help other people. And uh, I feel uh, they are very good picking out those people coming here and working. So for me, it's who, wa who wants to open up and, you know, getting help and allowing them to come in, you know, I, it's very important, yeah. We and like all the students decided to work in a prison and be a prison guard is because we really want to help people. We don't necessarily like like having the power over people, but we really want to help because they have had so much trauma in their life and that's just something we came in with and learned throughout the first semester on the academy. So not only do you know what to expect, 
They put you in so you can actually work the job before you go back to the academy to finish. So y'all are so blessed. You totally are. We're in the middle of an emergency staffing crisis, so I am working as a correctional officer, a job I wasn't, I didn't sign on to do, and I wasn't, I'm not really very well trained to do. What's left in that 40-hour week, I'm doing the best I can to manage my caseload. So I'm, um, if I go to a cell house right now, it's like desperation. My normal schedule is six day, six eight-hour shifts and a three-day weekend, essentially and I can be held for mandatory overtime or I can volunteer for overtime, and that's typically eight hours. So a six-day shift is typically 48, and if I get stuck four times, that's another 32 hours, which comes out to 80 hours in a week. The way our overtime works, they put a call out on the radio and say, we need however many people next or for the next shift. If anyone's interested, you can call and volunteer, and if they don't get enough volunteers to cover the shifts that they need, then we have what we call a mandatory list and we go down step by step based on the last time somebody was told they had to work. And if you're next up on the mandatory list, it doesn't really matter what you have going on. You either cover that shift or you typically pay somebody to cover that shift for you. Well, the room you're sitting in now, this is the Labour Party's uh, group room, we call it. And this is where we gather at least once a week, together with all our parliament members and most of our government members, and try to make some good politics for the country. Well, how do we develop the politics for the correctional services? Well, I would say, we can't do that without the professional voices. We need them. We can't do that without the unions. We do strongly believe that if uh, if we have the rights for the inmates and the rights for the working people, well, uh, that will make a good prison. We were nearing the end of our visit. What we wanted to spend on here was more like concrete next steps. Norway makes a great case as to why the de-escalation and everything. You really, when you hear it, when you see it, it's very hard to say, you know, it's always better. It's not. The mental and physical health of both the inmates and the correction officers that were in there, they were happier, more relaxed, more free to actually be rehabilitated. For us in New York State, they would want to hear what's happening in California and Connecticut and Michigan and all the other places because then it, 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 it gives some validity that we got to do something because it's spreading. This is the first time that I've been able to go anywhere and have other states say they're in the same boat as us. So if we can get everybody in New Hampshire to say they're on the same boat, then maybe we can look at like a comprehensive solution at that point. I always say from my first trip here, if you want to give the union a true seat at the table, you want to commit to two years of paid training, nine to one staffing ratios, and 45 minutes, 30 minutes of overlap between shifts, you should do the Norway model, that's totally right. That would be a great place to start. But all the other stuff without that, it's just piling uh, you know, impossible responsibilities on something that's totally decaying in front of you. The most important thing by bringing you guys over here is that you know that if the Norwegian model should work like we want it to work, it has a huge cost. And it's not just the point that the, the little fractions that your governors are bringing back from Norway. You can't just implement them and then you'll have a Norwegian model. You, you need staffing, but you also have to do something about hope because you can't change a person if they have no hope. You need time and you need patience if you want something to change. And the change has to start with you guys. We should be thinking in your mind, if I was to build a list, of what those key components that I think we could take home from this might be different than an administrator's. We know the union's involvement in helping to shape that, how they engaged up front, how they demanded that they take a rightful seat at the table as a stakeholder. 